Welcome to Book Carnival. My name is Anne, and I'm so happy you could be with us today to meet with Stuart Neville. Uh, we're going to be discussing his newest book, The House of Ashes. Get this up here. And found it wonderful. Better deal. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Um, We'll talk about that a little bit later, but I always do my research on authors and quite often I come up with things I find fascinating. And then when I talk to them about it, they tell them I never did that. So I'm gonna run a couple of things past you. To begin with, tell us what part of Ireland you're in. I'm in County Armagh. Um, I'm about uh, 30 minutes outside of Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, where it is currently just going with about 10 past eight in the evening and it's rainy and dark and yeah. I'm raining, you said. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, as you say, as you say, rain, rain would be welcome where you are. It's uh yeah. From as it starts raining here, it doesn't start stop again until March. So <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of dismal thought. Um <laughs> Now, uh, quite uh, as I mentioned, I do the research and then I say something and the author says, oh, no, that never happened. So what I found out supposedly about you, part of it I know is true. The first says you've been a musician. You still are. You're working with that band that entertains at these festivals with other authors, right? Yeah, the Fun Love of Crime Writers uh -huh. um, with, with uh, me and uh, Val McDermott. I'm sure some of you heard of uh, uh, Legendary Val McDermott, I should say. Uh, Mark Bellingham, uh, Luca Veste, Chris Brookmeyer, and Doug Johnson. Um, and we've been playing for oh, about three years now, I think, three, four years maybe. Um, obviously, I had a forced hiatus over the last 18 months or so, but we had our first gig post lockdown uh, last weekend in Sterling at the Bloody Scotland Festival just last weekend, which was fantastic. And I bet that felt really good. It was lovely. It was lovely to see my friends and to play on stage again, but also just to see readers and sign books and just uh, uh, um, being a writer is quite a solitary pursuit. Um, so going to book festivals and, and conventions are kind of your the only really socialising you do throughout the year. And I, I, I don't think I realise how much I miss them until back to Scotland just you know uh, having your lanyard around your neck and uh, readers coming up and introducing themselves or asking for books to be signed and just getting to talk to people and um, remind yourself you're not uh, just sort of shouting into the void when you write a book that there are people on the other end that are going to read them you know oh yes to a great extent and then um, a composer a teacher a salesman a film extra, which I found interesting. I haven't done that for a long time. No, but these are listing all the, uh, I found you had such a varied thing, a baker. And this I found especially fascinating, a hand double for a well-known Irish comedian. Yeah, I, I in a, this is going back some years now, uh, oh, more than 20 years probably, but uh, a comedian called Arlo Hannon. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with those TV series in the 90s called Father Ted about two priests living on Craggy Island off the coast of Ireland um, and that's where Arthur O'Hanlon kind of came to fame, he's very, but he's a very good stand-up comedian and, uh, but he was playing the lead role in a, in a short film that required him to play guitar and I was doing the music for the film and uh, so I had to be his hand double for the close-ups when I'm playing guitar Oh, uh, okay yeah. so that's how it <laughs> came about Yeah it's a funny thing, it was that little bio, I probably wrote that little bio about 12 years ago. And I'm thinking about things that only seem maybe quite recent history when I was writing that bio or now 20 years ago. So it's, 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 it's a bit strange. Well, I told you that strange things come up when you do research. Um, you've been the author of um, several uh, books, uh, smaller series. You had the Jack Lennon, Lennon uh, investigation, which included the wonderful Ghosts of Belfast, which was your first book, correct? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that series went on for one, two, three, four books, which was amazing. Well, yeah, um, it was a, a very loose. I'm sorry. Um, there were. Yeah, cutting out just a little bit, so. So Jack Lennon started with a very sort of minor character, at first then became the lead character. And um, then he took a back seat and Serena Flanagan took over for a few books. Right. Um, so uh, although there you can sort of break them up into different series, kind of all one loose series. Um, and I've never really regarded myself as a series writer in the way that uh, say Lee Child is with Jack Reacher or John Connolly is with Charlie Parker. Um, I've never sort of followed one character for more than a couple of books, really. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's more like the, the approach James Ellery takes, where he has uh, the same world, but you know, over three or four books, you might find Dudley Smith becomes a more prominent character and then fades into the background, or you know, it, it's it tends to be more the approach I've taken. Then there within that, there's the standalone books as well, like Rap Lines and uh, um, uh, the Heel and Back books that I wrote, and uh, the new one, House of Ashes is a standalone as well right um but it has uh, especially the first um four to six had a similar background and a similar environment with them yeah um and then of course my favorite which you wrote under the name of halen beck was here and gone and uh, lost you both mm -hmm. of which i thought were wonderful mm, thank you no, really um, yeah um halen beck alas is no more um dead and buried now but uh, it's quite possible i could end up writing books of that style again in the future but uh, it'll be under my own name if i do um okay yeah so it's it's um yeah the healing back thing it was a bit of it was a bit of a diversion um and i enjoyed writing them i'm so proud of those books and still stand over them um but that kind of experiment is is done with uh, in terms of the pen name um but I'll never say never. I may well write, end up writing those kind of higher concept thrillers again in the future. In fact, I more than likely will. It's just a matter of uh, finding the right idea. Well, I think it also shows your talent in not only writing about uh, what you did in the beginning, but being able to be a completely different type of writer for those books. Uh, and I think that speaks a lot for talent and skill. Well, thank you. Um, I mean... Those, those books are different and they are the, the, that kind of high concept standalone, probably more into the Harlan Coleman or Lemon Barkley kind of mm -hmm. sphere with those. But I think if, as you read them, I think they're still my books, if you know what I mean, they're still that kind of dark sort of uh, core to them. Um, yeah. yeah, they weren't light by any means. No, I mean, it, it, and it's, I think, I think I did try to make them lighter. I did try to make them more um, kind of breezy page turners, but the old, uh, the old uh, dark spurt keeps creeping in there, whether I, I wanted to or not. But um, yeah, and I, I enjoyed writing those books. They were, it was nice to be kind of um, liberated almost, you know, from the expectation of one of my books of the Northern Ireland setting and the politics and the, um, the grittiness that uh, people expect from me from a novel um so it was kind of a kind of almost like a good sort of cleansing by sort of doing something sort of quite different um, exactly yeah and, and i think it allowed me to come back to write under my own name then with maybe a fresher perspective as well and not feeling like i had to um fulfill expectations in the same way i was able to just write the story that i wanted to write and there's some kind of freedom in that when you do something yeah. that way. Yeah. And um, though I, I mean, I think what I started to struggle with when I, when I finished the two healing back books, again, because they're both quite high concept books, the sort of books you can describe in like sort of one line elevator pitch. Um, by the time I'd written two of them, I realized, you know, I didn't actually have a third one. There wasn't, there wasn't another one waiting to go. Uh -huh. And it's, it's quite tricky to come up with those sort of big pitch ideas um, and I had great admiration for writers who can actually do that repeatedly um, but I don't think I'm one of them unfortunately. Um, 
Well, but what you generate is wonderful. Uh, we decided as a book club this month that we read your uh, Those We Left Behind. That was our oh, book. Great. And um, uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, thank you. That's my personal favorite of all my books, I think. Oh, how wonderful to know. We'll be discussing it on uh, next Wednesday night when we have our meeting. Okay. Yeah. I'd love, I'd love to hear what people think of it. So, or, at least I think I would like to think, hear what people think of it. Um, um, I think that, that book, I think, um, I think it was the best, well, something I'm flattering myself, but for me, it was the one where things kind of clicked, I think, for me, there was a balance of kind of the thriller, the police procedure, but also character study as well. Um, and I think it's, 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 yeah, I think it's the one book. If anybody asked me to recommend one book that I'd written, that'd be the one I would hold up. But, you know, I can't be objective about it, obviously, so I don't know what other people would think necessarily. Uh, do the publishers um, guide you or give you any grief if you want to do something completely different? No, I mean, I've been published by Soho Press in the States uh, from the start, and they've always given me lots of leeway. Um, in the UK, there was a little bit of pressure to go down the series detective route, um, which I did do, and I, and I, I, I with Jack Land and Serena Flanagan. Um, but I never felt 100% comfortable with that, as like, like I said, or not, a, don't feel, feel I'm a series writer. And, and I, I have great admiration for you know, something like Ian Rankin or uh, uh, John Connery can come back to Cerebus or Charlie Parker mm -hmm. over and over and over again and still find something fresh within, with that character um, and still find new stories for them. Um, I struggle to do that over more than two or three books with one character. Um, I think that's a skill in itself to be able to sort of uh, come back to the same character again and again and still uh, have something new to say each time. Uh, I think more than anybody, John Connolly, I think, is, is a master that he can still keep coming back to Charlie Parker right. and still surprise us with those books. No, it, it's a, a whole different take, isn't it? Um, we're getting some questions. It says, when you write, do you know how the book will end? Do you start on the first page and go right through to the end, or do you write scenes and then go back? For the most part, um, I always have two things. I always have a point of departure and a point of destination uh, in that I'll know how the book starts, and I know exactly how it's going to end, usually in quite a detailed way. And that not, it's usually a specific scene I have in mind the way that's going to end. And everything between that from start, between the start and between the ending is completely open. It's completely up for grabs. And I've had books that have taken completely radical departures. In that middle section, they still wind up back where I wanted to be. But I find I, I when I struggle with a book, it's because I don't have an ending. Um, if I don't have an ending, the story will tend to kind of wander. I kind of need that um, sort of gravitational pull of the ending to sort of pull the story to that point. And if I don't have that, I can struggle. Um, and I wrote uh, before the Ghost of Belfast. I wrote uh, two novels that will never ever see the light of day. They're not very good. Um, and both of those, the problem I had with them is I didn't have an ending. Okay. And so the books were kind of aimless. Kind of they didn't they didn't have forward propulsion because the, the story spent so much time just spinning its wheels trying to find somewhere to go. Um, but having said all that, I'm not a planner. I might sort of map out a chapter or two ahead of myself, but I don't. I know one of those people that has like a, a cork board with the post-it notes stuck to it um, with all my plot points. I, I've never been that kind of a writer. Um, and again, I kind of wish I was because I think it would be an easier way of doing things. But um, yeah, I've never, I've never been able to sort of organize myself in such a way. Um, but again, every writer's different. I mean, you get, you can ask exactly. 100 writers about that method and you'll get 100 different answers. And I think you have to follow what works for you. Uh, you yeah. can't make yourself do something differently. Uh, no, another... I mean, sorry. Go ahead. No, go. No, I mean, it, it's, 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 um, some writers I know are much more disciplined. Um, 
like I know uh, in Rankin, he's talked about he has his few months of the year where he actually does his writing. And the rest of the year, he's kind of thinking about it and planning it and so on. But he'll have a set number of weeks where he's going to sit down and go from start to end. And he'll have the thing all mapped out. And that takes a very particular kind of discipline, which I'm afraid I lack. Um, I know Val McDermott, my good friend Val McDermott, like she's something similar. And she has her time of the year set aside where she's going to be drafting a novel and she has that all figured out before she starts. Um, uh, whereas I'm kind of just flailing. <laughs> trying to sort of figure out my way through the story. Um, yeah, so again, I admire writers who are able to do that and wish, I wish I could. Well, um, we're so happy with what you do, right? So we like the way you do it. So, oh, and, and every author is different. Uh, it can't work the same way for everybody. If it did, I think the, the books would become too similar, perhaps, or too, um, I'm not finding the right word, but it would homogenize them in yeah. some way. Yeah. Um, another question that came up is, uh, when did you know you wanted to be a writer and why did you pick the type of book you do write? Um, I wanted to be a writer from a really very young age. Um, uh, you know, since I was maybe six or seven years old. Ah. Um, oh. And I did, I'm not sure why, but we also had lots of books. My, my mom worked for the library service. So we didn't have money to, to buy lots of books. There were always books coming home from the library. Um, so I was always a reader and I had this sort of romantic idea in my head of what it'd be like to be an author. And I thought that, that sounded good. Until um, so I got to about the age of 12 or 13 and I discovered guitars and girls as well. And decided instead that I was going to be a rock star. Um, which seemed to me at that age a perfectly reasonable career path. And I had quite clearly mapped out my life. I was going to be a rock star from roughly the ages of 18 to about 35. Uh -huh. And I thought at 35, I'd stop being a rock star and become a writer instead. Um, and I kind of did that. Unfortunately, I missed out the rock star part. Um, I didn't find musical fame, unfortunately, but I did get to be a writer after the age of 35. I, I sort of wound up in that place anyway. Um, well, you, you were mentioning earlier my, my bio and all the different things, um, and, and it's, it's a common thread amongst writers, I think, where very often we kind of drift through life until we reach a certain point. Um, we achieve a certain vintage, and then we become writers, and I, th I think it, it, this isn't a universal thing. I mean, there are many younger writers that are, that are great and so on, but I, I think for most people, they need a few miles on the clock. Yeah, uh, they need a certain they need to travel a certain distance in life to 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 be able to be a writer, um, and I think that's why so many of us sort of flip from job to job in our younger years before we actually wind up writing stories is because it, it, you can need that time to find a voice. I think life experience really helps. Uh, has to help when you're writing. Um, feeling what other people would feel or what you want your character to do. I think so. Um, and, you know, if, if you're right, if, if themes like sort of parenthood are coming in or, or marriage or just grown up life stuff, if that's going to appear in your books, I think you have to have lived some of that. Um, I mean, imagination is great, but it'll only take you so far. Uh, and, it's, and, not, and it's not even so much in the details, it's in the feeling of things. If you know what I mean, it's, it's the feeling of, of, of you know, if, if, I, if some of my stories, the last, the healing back books have involved children in peril. And that's not something I wrote about until I actually had children. And, you know, it's hard to, if you don't have kids, it's hard to kind of imagine that protective feeling that you have for your kids. You know, it's, it's, I think you need that. Right. Just, you just need that sort of that something you need to know what it feels like until you actually have your own children yeah. yes yeah yeah, yeah it, it, i agree with that it's very hard to for someone to intuit that if they're not experiencing it or have experienced it yeah the difference in so your... not, not not to say it can't be done and i know there 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 will be many great writers who've written about parenthood who don't have kids but um uh I think it. I think it helps and makes it easier to to find your way into that kind of thing. Just 
any, any aspect, I mean, you, you can research and, and use your imaginative to write about anything that you want, um, but it just it gets a little bit easier, I think, when, you, when you've got some actual experience of it. And you said easier, but did you also find it harder once you had children to put them in peril or in a situation that was dangerous to them? Not in itself. I think it's one of the curses of, of, of having an imagination of having, being a writer is that um, you spend an awful lot of time imagining the worst things possible and then picking out the bits that you actually want to write down. But I, I do have an overactive imagination and fear. Uh, like if, if my wife goes out with the kids somewhere in the car, if they're not home exactly on time, I start to panic. Uh, just because my, my my mind is sort of making all these scenarios. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's sometimes it's, it's hard to switch that. That, yeah. uh, that, that sort of... Uh, Switch off. That's her second sight. If you like, you know that. That's, it is. Uh, yeah, that, that's her. That part of the, the, the nightmares come from. Definitely different. Um, another question here. Uh, the person says the twelve was one of my favorites. It's well killer. Uh, well, something about killer. Love the intensity, but also the connections to Northern Ireland's history. Can you talk about some of that process and how much truth is woven into the story of the Twelve? Um, uh, uh, for those who don't know, the Twelve was the UK and Ireland title of the Ghosts of Belfast. It's the same book. Mm -hmm. um, that book was written um, at a very specific time. Was, I wrote it in 2007. And it was against the backdrop of... You know, when I started the book, uh, things weren't looking good here for the peace process because uh, the political parties couldn't agree on anything, they couldn't establish a government. Um, and as I was writing the, the book, um, there were talks at St Andrews and we got the St Andrews Agreement, which then brought about a Stormont government in Belfast. Um, and all this is happening while I was writing the book. And these events in the real world started to shape the book. And um, the... Settlement at that time, I mean, I mean, this was 10 years after the Good Friday Agreement had been settled, so it was kind of an agreement on an agreement that had already been made. Um, but things were looking so perilous and so uh, uh, so delicately balanced, and then all of a sudden it was going to work, and then all of a sudden we had a government. It provided some stakes uh, for the story, some real-world stakes, that there was actually the whole country, country could be thrown out of balance if... if knew the story didn't go the right way um so yeah it was it was that book was very much of a moment uh at that time and it was it, it channeled a feeling and i think a lot of people in northern ireland felt this of um how justice um was set aside as a matter of political expediency you sacrifice justice for peace um and there was a feeling at the time of that they'd gotten away with it, that the same people who had profited for so long from conflict were now profiting from peace. Um, so it's quite an angry book as well, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And that it, uh, uh, yeah, there's kind of a reckoning in it, a reckoning in it that was never going to happen in the real world. Um, but, you know, it's something at the time we all accepted. We all accepted that, uh, uh, yeah, there are families of, of people who died, families of people who murdered, that were never going to see any form of justice. Um, and as unfair as that is, I think we were all willing to accept that just so that our kids don't have to grow up through, through the same things that I grew up through. Um, and we're starting to see it now. I mean, it's been strange here that this this so last year or two, there's been a lot of controversy over um, the idea of an amnesty. Uh, the, the British government were proposing the idea of basically drawing a line under the, the troubles and, and not prosecuting legacy cases, you know, murders from the 70s and 80s and so on. Um, 
it was a rather cynical move from the government that it was primarily aimed at uh, protecting members of the armed forces um, from prosecution, but in the same motion, it would also protect uh, paramilitaries as well. And it, the idea did not go down well with the public. Um, but at the same time, we, we know that most of the people who have blood on their hands are never going to pay any kind of price for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, I mean, that's, uh, I don't know if I went back and re- if I wrote that book today, it would be a very different book, I think. But um, I haven't gone back and reread it. And it might be an interesting exercise just to see how it wrapped in its time it is, you know. But it was appropriate for the time. Absolutely. It felt well. I, I think it was a book of its moment. Um, you know, people often ask me about a film adaptation because, I mean, it was uh, it was under option for quite some time. And I don't know. I think it's time has passed. I don't, I don't think that would work right now if it was adapted because the landscape has shifted so much. Hmm. Um, even though you're only, only talking about 14 years from the time I was writing the book. Um, quite a while. Yeah. You know, I suppose yes, yeah, nearly a decade and a half, but it's 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 Northern Ireland itself has gone through so many changes since then, and at that time was in the in the the sort of the agonies of change as I was writing it as well. So yeah, it's it's. I think you'd have to if you read it now. I think you'd have to be aware that it is it is a snapshot of a mm-hmm. moment in time. Yes. Uh, are there any talks about optioning any of your books? Um, because they are quite, they would translate very well to film. Well, things are talked about now and again. You'll get, I'll get a occasional email that so and so were just sniffing around the books. Um, Rose of Belfast, aka the Twelve, was under option for about five years um, by Craig Ferguson, the Scottish comedian and American TV host, and um, and that was got fairly well advanced. I think that that um, Pierce Brosnan was lined up to play Jerry Fagan at one time, um, but I, I think we, I think we just couldn't raise the money to get it made. And then Ratlines was in development with uh, RTE Television, the Irish uh, broadcaster, um, and that got fairly far along as well as a eight episode uh, uh, a series written for it and so on. Here and gone. I've seen a couple of drafts of screenplays for that, um, but I don't know what the status of that project meant. Film options are, are something you can't dwell too much upon. If somebody writes you a check, you just bank it and say thank you and then forget it because the, the chances of anything I ever actually getting made are so, so tiny. Um, so I just look at any option that comes along, just look at it as a couple of mortgage payments and then forget about it because there's nothing I can do. But I, well, well, I've was closely involved with the Ratlines project, but I, it was enough to teach me that I don't want to do that again. Um, I don't want to be involved yeah. in a screening adaptation of any of the books because it's just too, I was more of a hindrance than a help uh, with that project because I was too precious about it. Um, so and yeah, it's very time consuming and very time consuming for an author. Yeah, I mean, you know, there was, I mean, I, I did get paid and so on, but it was, yeah, it was an awful, there was maybe 18 months, a couple of years maybe, spent going around different scripts and meetings and uh, quite a lot of work and then for it to mount, not to mount to anything. Right. Um, I, I, I wonder, it's, I mean, I've known a couple of screenwriters who've moved from uh, writing for film into writing novels and a large part of the reason why they do that is they get so frustrated at nothing actually getting made. Um, you know, I've known people who have made a very good living as screenwriters and never had a single thing produced. Um, yes, I hear that a lot. Yeah, but I, I, I would find that sort of soul crushing to do that. So it, it's, it's, um, and I think I'm not, I'm not cut out for that business. I'm not cut out for the film business at all. It's far more, it's not as genteel as publishing. Publishing is generally quite nice. Everybody's quite friendly, whereas uh, my experience of, uh, uh the screen trade is that it's a much more hostile mm-hmm. environment, particularly to writers. What do you want to tell us about the House of Ashes? Um, other than to buy it from your good self. Um, and I, do, do, do you have book plates, signed book plates? 
Oh, I have books, yes. Oh, but, um, but yeah, it's... Uh, and I received book plates. Uh, yes, yes. 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 That's what I yeah, book plates. Um, yeah, this one's a long time in the making. I started this book, um, I think as far back as maybe 2016, 2017. I had this rough idea of a book based very, based very, very loosely on a, a real life uh, crime that happened here. A few years back, it was a, a case of abuse within a family that wound up with a, a, a pretty terrible murder suicide, uh, a family annihilation. Um, and I kept looking at that story and thinking that, that, that I might want to write something about it, but I realized that it was in such such recent past and that there would be family and some of the, of the victims of this that would be affected and it would be really in very poor taste for me to actually base something on it. Um, so the, the idea kept moving further and further away from what the, the real life case was until it's not really recognizable as it anymore. But I, I couldn't seem to get it to work very often when you're writing a book. I find that I have to take some time and actually just figure out what I've got. Um, you, you know, you've got maybe an idea of maybe some characters, situation, whatever it is, but you're not quite sure how that's actually going to function as a story. Um, you know, sometimes I'm not sure if it's a short story or a novella or a novel or maybe it's a screenplay idea and it takes a while maybe to figure out what, what you've actually got. Um, and this book took a long time. I, I couldn't figure out what was going on with it. My, and I, I wrote kept writing maybe four or five chapters, maybe a few thousand words, and then deleting them, realizing it just wasn't working. And it wasn't until I read a book uh, called Country by an old friend of mine called Michael Hughes, who's from Armagh area, same as me. And he, it's a retelling of the Iliad. This, it's, it's a much more readable book than it sounds from my description here. It's a retelling of the Iliad set in the border counties of Ireland at the end of the Troubles. And it's written entirely in a vernacular voice with a very, very strong accent. Um, and when I read that, I realized that's what I needed for the point of view of one of the characters in this book, Mary Jackson, who is, we meet her as an elderly lady at the start of the novel. And then we go back and find out about her childhood in House of Ashes uh, as a child. And her chapters are written from her point of view in uh, Northern Irish vernacular and a lot of dialect uh, from Ulster Scots language. And uh, once, I, once that clicked, um, I was then able to start writing the book and I wrote Mary's half of the story along with a story that's set in the present day. Mary's story takes place 60 years ago. Um, I should go back and sort of describe the premise of the book, really, shouldn't I? For this to make sense. That's the um, um, The book opens with uh, a young English woman called Sarah Keane. And she's moved to Northern Ireland with her husband, who's from here originally. And uh, they've moved because she's had what's kind of uh, vaguely referred to as a, as a nervous breakdown, some sort of incident, um, which we later find out was a suicide attempt. So... His father is a property developer and has bought this house that was almost destroyed in a fire and has rebuilt it and refurbished it and they move into this house. But as soon as she's there, Sarah realizes something isn't quite right, um, including these red stains on the stone floor. No matter how many times she washes them away, they keep coming back. And they're in the house for three or four days. And the third or fourth morning, um, there's a hammering on the front door at 6 a.m. And she goes to the door and it's an elderly lady called Mary Jackson who's screaming at her, demanding to know why she's why Sarah's in her house and what has she done with her children. And Sarah's husband appears and whisks Mary back to the uh, care home that she's been living in. So Sarah's disturbed by this and she starts to look into the history of the house and discovers that uh, something terrible had happened here 60 years ago that Mary was at the centre of. And... Um, as she starts to explore it, we start to see from Mary's point of view what actually happened 60 years ago. And Sarah and Mary form this bond over kind of a shared trauma in that um, as we see Sarah's relationship with her husband, we see that it's not a healthy one either. We see that he's controlling and he controls money, that his moving her to Northern Ireland has been a part of isolating her. 
Um, so as the story goes on, as, as Sarah and Mary form this bond, it gives Mary the, 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 the will to actually tell her story after 60 years of silence and for Sarah to stand up to her abuser. And the story then interweaves between the present day and the and 60 years ago. And um, yeah, I said you'll need to read it to find out more. Um, but yeah, it was a difficult, a difficult birth, this book. And even when it was what I when I thought it was finished, I had written an entirely different present day story to what's actually in the book now. And it was after the book was sold to Soho Press in the States and Bonnie Air Zafra in the UK that I decided I wasn't happy with the present day story and completely scrapped it. So basically binned half the book and wrote it again from scratch. And that's wow. what's now in the finished book. Um, so yeah, it was a good maybe oh, four or five years grinding this one out. Well, it was well worth it. It's a wonderful book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just intriguing in keeping up with it. Did you, did you find it hard to go back and forth in time or did you do one time period at a time? How did you no. work that? I when it, in the original draft of the book, um, I alternated as the chapters do between present day and and the past, um, and that's part of the reason why I think it didn't quite work. That version of the book was that the present day story was kind of felt very secondary to the story in the past. Um, so when I came back, when I scrapped that section, I came back and I wrote the present day story all in one stretch. And I realized then that's what it should have been all along. I should have written the two stories separately. But I, I think what I've wound up with is the two stories um, interleave. Mm -hmm. I hope quite well. Not, you know, as you read some of the sections set in the past, they shed more light on what's going on in the present. As you read a present day chapter, it sheds more light on what's going on in the past. And I think that it's um, the two stories are far more cohesive now together. And they, they're, they're kind of, it'll be difficult to separate the two. Because no, both, I, one, one needs the other to kind of hold it up. I just thought it was brilliant uh, uh, the way you did it. I'm curious though, the author, or I'm uh, not the author, the publisher accepted your first version and was willing to publish it. How did they feel when you wanted to do the present day all over again? Um, they're very supportive. Um, no, it, it's uh, Soho Press and my editor, Julia Graham's who has been a good friend of my under for, for some years now. Um, I, oh, you know, Julia, yeah, you, you yeah. Know, yeah. Um, and she's a very good writer, she's a great writer as well. The, the Seven Eight Deaths of Stella Fortuna is a wonderful book, which I can thoroughly recommend. Um, yeah, Julia, basically I, I emailed Julia and, and I should also add they've been waiting a long time for this book as well, because it was sold to them in 2016, I think. Um, so they've been they were, so they were very very patient with me um far beyond the call of duty and uh we're very supportive it's very supportive when i decided i wanted to rewrite half the book you know she basically said do what you need to do and at the same time i moved publisher in the uk i had been with horrible sector uh from my first book but this book was the first one with uh bonnie air zafra and a new editor and again very accommodating i explained what i was doing and they said no problem that's amazing. That's great. It's great, and it's 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 um it's wonderful wonderful to have that support um from your editors and and uh, not just your own editor, but the people um that are sort of doing the uh, they're running the publisher as well. You know, the, you know, the business end. Um, but yeah, everybody was very accommodating, and I'm very glad of that. Um, yeah, I, I I can't I can't uh, speak highly enough. Um. Well, it makes well, you, enough for that. it makes you feel better about going forward with this publisher because uh, they would be open to your ideas or your changes. It means they're part yeah. of your team. Yeah, and um, also I feel of, of a bit more freedom now as well. I don't feel restricted in what I want to write or can write. I, 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 I between. Soho have always been very, very uh, uh, flexible with me. Uh, Bonnie and Zappa have been the same. That I, I, I kind of decided when I was writing this book that I wasn't going to try to write to an audience anymore, that I was just going to write what I wanted to write. 
um, whether it be commercial or not commercial. Um, and just the story had to just be the story I need to write at that time. And it's it's good to have publishers that will back me on that. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't make things easy for them when they're trying to pitch books to taking in the UK to supermarkets and so on. And it makes them harder. It makes it harder to sort of find my particular bracket on the shelf. Um, but um, yeah, no, they've been very good. Very good and and helped me do this. I think that's wonderful. Um, do we have any more questions? I've got a couple here that don't relate to the book, but um, you've talked about your process and how much truth is woven into the various stories. Um, one of the questions is, how many guitars do you have? Because uh, they're re looking at your background, which is so impressive. And do you listen to music as you write? If so, what kind? Uh, well, the guitar's last count was roughly 35. I'd have to go over and check them. Um, some of them, I, I've been building guitars. It's my big thing during lockdown, during the oh. pandemic, because I started building guitars. Um, including that one right there I built. Um, just as kind of a, a, as a thing to do. <laughs> Uh, when I'm locked in the house. Um, yeah, also means like it's easier to convince my wife to let me build a guitar than buy one. Um, but I'll, uh, yeah, um, I do listen to music. I I know a lot of writers can't listen to vocals when they write. An awful, an awful lot of writers will have to have instrumental music, but I'm okay with vocals. I can kind of have it there as a sort of background noise. Um, and it could be anything or everything, anything from Kiss to Van Halen, to Miles Davis, to some old blues, whatever. It's 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 uh, all sorts. Um, I don't, I, there's nothing I find, I don't find any, any one kind of music more conducive to writing than another. That's um, great. The variety is good. It is, it is. Um, I used to, I don't, I haven't been able to because of the pandemic, but I used to go and write in my local library and music was an important thing there because I put headphones on and I could kind of the music became a wall between me and everybody else in the library um, yeah. and I still need to have it on when I write but it's it's unfortunately I haven't been able to do that now since uh, since way back in the old days um, I had a question and it's kind of fading on me uh, because I was lo looking at something here um, do you do you ever conceive of branching out completely and doing something completely opposite of what you've done in the past, uh, a, a comedy or a um, a romance even? Mm. Do you ever think of that, or is that not something that would appeal? I have I've actually discussed the the the, the uh, uh, book ideas with my wife. We we've, we've talked about maybe trying to co-write something. Um, I'm saying this publicly now to try and coax her into actually doing it. My wife is actually a good writer, but she insists she can't write, but I know she can't because I've seen her writing. And I, I, I think we could write a, well, she could write and I could maybe add some punctuation to, to uh, some uh, some good romance fiction. But um, I did once try to write a comedy screenplay. And I think I wrote about 10 or 15 pages. And that's the worst thing you've ever read. It was terrible. It was not even remotely funny. It was, oh... It was so bad. I sometimes dig it out and just read it again just to remind myself how bad it was and that I should never ever try to write comedy. Um, it's, it's, it, it, I, I don't write funny at all. Um, and I know writers who do, and I admire the, the, the skill in doing that, but it's not something I can do. Okay. And I've tried. Well, you tried. That's important. <laughs> um, you mentioned at the beginning that you've been to the Scotland Festival recently. Yeah. Do you have book signings, live book signings now going forward in Ireland? Um, they're starting to come along now. It's it's a, a Bloody Scotland Festival, which was in Stirling last weekend. Um, is the first uh, in-person crime festival I think there's been since uh, oh, the sort of start of 2020 um, in this part of the world. Um, Oh, it was fantastic. I, 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 I'm not, I think things, live events are starting to trickle in. Um, 
very slowly though. I think people are it's 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 I think there's a it's it's as much as people want to get out and start doing things again, there's also I think a little bit of fear mm-hmm. of it as well. I think it's maybe people might be reluctant to actually leave the house now that we've been sort of uh uh, sort of heading away for so many months and no, a year and a half. Um, I know I certainly going to Scotland, having to get on a plane, and go through the airport and so on, and queue and security and all that, was very nervous about that. But um, you know, having to sort of tell myself that you know this is it now, this is the world we have that we're left with to deal with post pandemic, and um, we have to just trust the vaccine to do its work and trying to get on with things so I, th- I think you'll see things starting to pick up more in the spring I think people are maybe a bit wary now of the winter coming on and um, the case rate has been so high here in Northern Ireland and throughout the rest of the UK and Ireland um, that people I think are still cautious and will be more so over the winter mm-hmm. but I think maybe as spring comes on um, I think people will start to be more open to things then I know there have been a few book signings seen a few authors posting about actual in-person events over the last few weeks but i think they're still quite rare i think it will be for a while yet yeah we're going to try um i have several set up for october with fingers crossed that it's going to work uh september had a few which we converted to virtual because it just things took a nosedive again yeah but um i'm hoping that we can go forward with the ones in october uh, and I said to you earlier, when the next, whenever my next book comes out, I'd love to get over there and come and see you in person again. It's been too I long. Love that. Anybody else? We're kind of um, running out of conversation here. I don't see any other questions. Um, tell us, uh, what authors do you read? Oh, what have I been reading lately? Um, I've been reading some more local authors recently Northern Irish authors um, like Sharon Dempsey uh, an excellent book out uh, this past year called Who Took Eden Mulligan um, Brian McGilloway uh, he won the Thaxons Award uh, for a book called The Last Crossing which is terrific, I'd, I'd really recommend that um, I find I'm, I'm less inclined to read crime these days simply because um just because I write it, so it, it's I'm less inclined to read it. Um, but uh, I was reading, for example, the, there's a new translation of Into the West, uh, the Monkey King. Mm-hmm. Um, the translator's name I can't remember. The the Chinese uh, uh, sort of epic uh, from the from, from the 17th century, I think it's from. Um, that and. Uh, there's a really good book I've just been reading by Kia Abdullah, um, and the title of the book has gone out of my head. I also read, I really, really enjoyed uh, Rabbit Hole by Mark Billingham, a good friend of mine, um, but it's a particularly good audio book. I, I don't know if it's been released this way in the States, uh, but there's um, an actress called Maxine Peake who did the narration on the audio book for this, and it's really, really good. Okay. Um, I, I do. I, I, Quite often, more I'm probably more likely to read an audiobook these days than I am a physical book because um, it makes it easier to turn off that analytical part of my brain. Where if I'm reading a novel, I'm constantly reading, thinking, oh, I wouldn't have phrased it like that. I wouldn't have used that word. You know, I can't stop those wheels turning and allow myself to read a book. Um, so an audiobook sometimes is a good way to bypass that. Um, so I'm I'm quite an, an advocate of audiobooks, and I, I believe the state you can you can sell you sell audiobooks through the store, and there's yes, yes, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm 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 a big fan of audiobooks. I find a lot of people uh, like it for when they're getting ready in the morning, or when they're driving to work, uh, or jogging, or whatever they're doing uh, when they couldn't sit and hold a book. Uh, they find that yeah. helpful. Um, I haven't gotten to that point yet i think they i know there's some wonderful narrators out there and that makes all the difference in the world who does who does your books well there have been a few different ones those jared doyle did a lot of the earlier books and i know he was very popular with the listeners um ghost of belfast did i remember it particularly well as an audiobook it was, it was not it was audible's number one bestseller a couple of times um 
Uh, he, yeah, he did a really good job in the narration of that. There's um, my short story collection, The Traveller and other stories. I don't know if it's the same narrator elsewhere, but the edition, the audiobook that was here was by a guy called Alan Turkington who did a really good job. Um, and there's a new narrator on The House of Ashes. I, I haven't had a chance to hear it yet. Um, but I'm going to try and give it a listen if I can. It's a little bit unsettling to listen to your own books as an audiobook because the narrator never phrases things the way they sounded in your head. You know, you, you, you constantly listen to go, no, 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 that's, that's you're emphasizing entirely the wrong word there. Um, so, yeah, but I, I'm going to give that a listen. Um, but yeah, no, audiobooks are, I, I, we're very fond of audiobooks in, in our house because we, we tend to buy the physical book and the audiobook and sometimes switch between the two as we go. Sure. That sounds like it works. Um, I want us to stay in touch because if you make it over to the U.S., we certainly want you at Book Carnival. Wouldn't want to Absolutely. miss the chance. Um, if no one else has any other questions, anything else you wanted to tell us, Mark? Uh, Stuart, you've done a wonderful job, but anything else you wanted to throw out there? Um, just to keep supporting your local bookstore as much as you can. It's, it's um, I, I, I said this repeatedly that uh, in the early days of my career in the States, um, when the big chain bookstores didn't really want to know, it was the independent bookstores that were hand selling the Ghost of Belfast. So you and Orange and uh, like Murder by the Book and Use in Texas, Poison Pen and Scottsdale. Those bookstores were hand selling the books. And if it, you know, if it wasn't for those um, in the early days, I wouldn't have a career in the States. Well, and so I'm most appreciative of that and, and I hope, hope people continue to support. Absolutely. And we look, we look for talent like you that way and are thrilled when we find it. So everyone, the book is The House of Ashes. It's available. And we thank you so much for this interview today. I, it's still midday for us, but I know it's getting later and later for you. It might be time for a glass of wine. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll second that. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. And thanks everybody else who's logged on here. I hope you enjoy it. The books are available at the store. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>